Evening, everyone. Welcome to the February 2020 meeting of the New York ARSC uh, chapter. Um, in honor of Black History Month, we have a very special program this evening. It's called the Black Swan Project, and I'll explain it as, it goes, as we go along. The CD reissue Black Swans restores a lost area of black cultural history, performances by classically trained performing artists and composers from the early part of the 20th century. These sparsely distributed acoustic recordings, products of the earliest African-American commercial recording ventures, are valuable documents of a great culture's accomplishments. The CD includes broom specials, complete output, most of Roland Hayes' Columbia made personal records and the Black Swan Classical 7100 series. Tim Brooks will discuss his unique set of brooms used for this reissue. Uh, Harry T. Burley, Art, what is it? Oh, sorry, if you are it, you're here to f help me with that. Harry T. Burley, Art Nathaniel Dett, okay. Edward H. Boder and Clarence Cameron White contribute interpretations of their music and arrangements and Antoinette Garnes, Florence Cole Talbert, and Hattie King R R Revis. Revis, okay, sing opera and spiritual selections. Most were recorded before Man uh, Mamie Smith's Crazy Blues and a few years before Marian Anderson's first Victor discs. That's interesting. Now about our host for the evening. Tim Brooks has written nine books on historical medium including Lost Sounds, Blacks and the Birth of the Recording Industry, 1890 to 1919, published in 2004, which led to a Grammy-winning CD of the same name and eventually to the excellent quote-unquote Black Swan CD discussed at this meeting. He has been active in ARS for many years. Many, many years, right, Tim? Serving two terms as president. You should get a purple heart for that one. And in numerous other positions. His latest book is The Blackface Minstrel Show in Mass Media, which includes recordings. He is a retired network television executive and lives in Connecticut. We're not saying where, so we'll keep it, we'll keep it a secret. Leslie Gerber was born in Brooklyn, New York, my hometown, and attended Brooklyn College. For 39 years, he ran a small, he ran a small, excuse me, he ran a mail order business specializing in used and ra rare classical LPs and CDs. He published LPs briefly in the early 1970s and then has run a CD label since 1996, uh, both as Parnassus Records. He is a former review editor of the Ars Journal and has written many reviews for the American Record Guide, Fanfare, Classical Pulse, Amazon, and the Professional Reviews, and the Woodstock Times. He lives in Woodstock with his dog, Winnie. Okay, well, anyway, this is gonna be quite an evening and very enjoyable. I saw, I got a preview of this at the uh, annual conference in Portland, where there, it was a very truncated presentation. So tonight, you were able to let your hair down and do as much as you want. Wow. So, yeah, between the three of us, I don't think we could make a wig. But anyway, uh, let me introduce Tim Brooks first, and then Les Gerber will follow him. Tim, it's all yours. I think most people, when they think of the earliest black recordings, think of jazz, blues, uh, and of course, in the 20s, there were many very famous uh, artists that came from that field. There was a parallel field, though, uh, going on at the same time, which was largely ignored by the record companies, uh, and that was black concert music. And I use the term concert, not necessarily operatic, although some of it was, but uh, uh, concert material uh, as opposed to popular material. Uh, and as um, Seth has indicated, uh, this CD, uh, thanks to Les, uh, who initiated it, we'll talk about it later, uh, brings together the very earliest of those recordings of black concert artists. Uh, the, uh, these artists at this time uh, played a major role in the evolution of, of black music, African American music. Uh, even though it's not as recognized today because of the jazz and blues. Uh, part of, partly that's because, as, as you're well aware, I, I'm sure, most of you, the uh, record labels of the time did not want to record black artists singing anything other than spirituals and uh, perhaps coon songs, as they were called, southern melodies, things that they thought were typical to that field. They didn't understand that field at all. Uh, nor did they think it would sell, and there are 
I mentioned in my book, Lost, Lost Sounds, some of the uh, correspondence that went on, actually, urging the record companies to record a few of these artists, and the record companies uh, just saying, uh, we don't think it'll sell. Uh, when we have Caruso, we don't need you. Uh, so others, uh, others came into the uh, field to try to rectify that. Uh, and they were real pioneers. Um, this, is, this is kind of what you saw in terms of classical music that was recorded at the time. I think the, the term Victor Supremacy is, is uh, carefully chosen. <laughs> they certainly felt that way. Uh, but they certainly weren't going to uh, take out an ad like that for somebody who was African American, not in the teens or before. Uh, Ironically, this was a period where, uh, again, not written about very much, uh, black music, uh, serious black music was uh, expanding rapidly. Uh, there was a, a movement called Black Uplift, which, which was promoted by uh, leaders in the black community, people like W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, to uh, encourage blacks to achieve more in, in many fields. It started arguably in the 1870s, uh, and continued up till uh, 1920 or so, uh, the dawn of the uh, Harlem Renaissance. During that period, that 50-year period, uh, uh, many uh, famous or, or very accomplished uh, poets, painters, writers, uh, emerged in the black community, but they were kept in the black community, kind of a parallel universe. This book uh, you see behind me, Music and Some Highly Musical People was published in eight, uh, seven, 1878 uh, by James Monroe Trotter. Uh, it's a landmark. It's now recognized as that. But what it did for the first time was bring together in one volume um, profiles of the leading serious black artists of that time. Uh, people like Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield, the original Black Swan, by Blind Tom Bethune, <laughs> Uh, the Fisk Jubilee Singers and the Hire Sisters, uh, uh, musicians who were very accomplished and showed another side of black talent, not just the minstrel talent. Uh, so um, there was also advances in black uh, business ventures, uh, Madam C.J. Walker, people like that, that built great businesses among the African-American community. Uh, poets like Dunbar, uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, uh, but alongside of that were advances in music, and there was, I found, a black concert circuit that grew up on the East Coast primarily, uh, and it consisted of uh, many performances in, in churches and, and local uh, venues. Uh, there were competitions held uh, uh, um, by people like uh, E. Azalea Hackley and Daisy Tapley, would stage these competitions and concerts to, to discover new black talent and give them a, a forum. Uh, this all existed parallel, like a different world, from the, black, from the uh, white concert world and was very little recognized by the white concert world or by the publications uh, that it spawned. Uh, it was simply dismissed, basically. And this is the world in which uh, Roland Hayes emerged first of our artists. Uh, Roland Hayes was bro born into poverty in Georgia, grinding poverty, uh, in the year 1887. He had a, a um, driving ambition from the time he was a child to be a concert singer. He had a fine voice. Uh, that was, everybody told him, impossible. <laughs> Find something that you can actually do in your life because the con concert halls are closed, there are no recordings by them, no performances in, in major venues, nobody will manage you, so find something else. But Roland Hayes, who I wrote a chapter on in my book, uh, was a remarkably determined man. I won't go through his biography here, but uh, boy, he, he would walk through walls. Uh, once he got his mind on something, nothing could stop him. Uh, and by the 1910s, uh, he had uh, developed quite a reputation and, and studied with, with some very leading uh, teachers in the field, developed his art. Uh, he moved to Boston, which was a much more favorable city for African Americans in those days, relatively speaking, uh, and built his career there. Uh, he really fought for it, too. He sang with the Fisk Singers for a while. But despite all of that, uh, 
he could not get a record company interested in him, and he, and he tried. Uh, so in 1917, he decided uh, in his typical, if nobody else will do it, I will way, to put out his own records. Uh, these were the uh, Roland Hayes personal records. They're called that because they were made by Columbia, uh, and he paid for them. They had a uh, personal recording service, uh, quite an active one actually, uh, in which if you paid them enough money, they would make a record for you and they would make enough copies. Were, it was priced so high that it didn't really make sense as a commercial venture, but if you wanted vanity records, corporations would want them, rich individuals would sometimes uh, make records for their grandchildren or something like that. Uh, believe me, if you hear very many of these, you hear a lot of really terrible people, but you hear some very talented people too who could not get onto record any other way. Uh, and by going to Columbia, Going to Columbia, he was able to get uh, lateral cut records. At that time, only Columbia and Victor could, by patent, make lateral records, which would play on most machines. Uh, and they were well done. Columbia, as well as Victor, they knew what they were doing in the acoustic recording studio. So they're well-made recordings. Uh, so he put out uh, either eight or nine of these over the period of a little more than a year. Uh, we're not sure. There's one that was advertised once and has never turned up. It's not in the files, but uh, at least eight of them, uh, for which he paid dearly. Uh, he sold them, since the record companies wouldn't stock them, he sold them through a network of uh, supporters across the country. They would be listed in his ads, actually, who they were. Uh, these are African-American individuals who supported what he was doing. Uh, he would uh, send them the records. Uh, and they would then go door to door, literally, in their communities to sell these records to others who, who would be interested in hearing a genuine black tenor on record. Uh, they were uh, single face, pressed on one side. Uh, they cost a dollar or more each. He got complaints at the time that these cost too much. There's a lot more than you would pay for a regular production Victor or Columbia record, of course. Uh, and he was able to have made about uh, 500, we estimate, uh, copies maximum of each one of these. Uh, and the whole project was a financial disaster, as you can imagine. Nevertheless, it preserved on record uh, from 1917-1918 the voice of Roland Hayes in his prime, uh, just as he was entering his prime, actually, uh, and therefore are extremely important uh, cultural documents. Uh, I've located copies of most of them. Uh, uh, this is an, an ad that he took out in the uh, Boston Symphony publication, I believe, listing most of them there. Uh, and uh, they're very hard to find. Only 500 or less of, or fewer made originally, shipped around the country. Uh, you can imagine how far hard these are to locate. I believe there are two of them on the current uh, auction list from Kurt Knock if somebody really, really, really wants to pay a lot of money for one. Uh, a couple haven't turned up at all yet, or at least one hasn't turned up at all. Uh, so uh, Hayes, during uh, about a 12 to 18 month period, sold these records. Uh, and they were an artistic triumph, a financial disaster, as I say. Now, this is the ad he took out. Uh, I want you to notice at the bottom of the ad uh, the address where he sold them from uh, and the name uh, of his agent at the bottom. These will become important to us. Tim, I got a question. Yeah. Why are the prices all different on each title? Uh, if you study the uh, Columbia pricing schedule, you have to pay more if you have a second voice, you have to pay more if you have an orchestra. You have to pay more if you, you know, go to the bathroom. You, they, they had lots of it. <laughs> uh, so it cost him more to make certain records than others. And he, he priced them, hopefully, according to his correspondence, to break even. Uh, it's dubious whether he did or not, but uh, that's the reason why they were at different prices. Remember, these were single-faced records. Victor was sing still single-faced, but they tended to charge even more than this. Columbia was uh, double-faced for their classical records, and they were cheaper than this. Uh, which is why I got the complaints. Okay. Uh, okay, so notice those two uh, names. This is Boylston Street uh, in 1911, a few years earlier. 
uh, as I say, a friendly city, relatively speaking, that's important to say, uh, for African Americans at that time. Uh, Burleson Street is a beautiful street. It is to this day with a park on the, on the left-hand side and, and buildings on the right. That's where the uh, music company was located that uh, Hayes worked out of. He obviously had some kind of arrangement with them. Uh, the other name that appeared on that ad that I showed you was a man named George W. Broome, B-R-O-O-M-E. Uh, he was also based in Boston. Uh, he was a black entrepreneur who uh, had promoted concerts in the past, uh, had made films of historically black colleges to promote them, uh, and uh, he obviously had connections in the black cultural world. Uh, he and Hayes didn't get along. Hayes fired him after a while, uh, reasons not known. Uh, and after the Hayes venture ended uh, in late 1918, Hayes went off on a concert tour, the West Coast or something, uh, Broom decided to start his own label, learning from uh, the experience of the, of the Hayes uh, venture. Uh, he wound up recording uh, 10 sides, original sides, by black talent who he had contact with. Uh, and these are also quite rare, as you can imagine. Stores would not stock them either, so he had to sell by mail. Uh, he operated out of his home, uh, uh, which was, uh, you see it on the label here, was in Medford, Mass. Uh, he also priced them uh, at a, a level that was competitive, a dollar for a now double-faced record. Uh, but he didn't use Columbia in their uh, useless uh, uh, pricing fees for making records. Uh, we're not sure where they were recorded, but the current thinking is it was probably at one of the independent recording labs that were springing around in New York. Also, <clears throat> fortunately, at just this time, the patent stranglehold that Victor and Columbia had was starting to break down, and other labels were coming into the field with lateral recordings, uh, so he could make lateral recordings generally playable uh, for a more reasonable price, timing uh, being the key to that. Um, these are well recorded. Again, we don't know where they were recorded or pressed, um, but they were well recorded. Uh, they do use a very unusual narrow groove. I find they play best with a 1.5 mil stylus, which is much less than uh, a Victor or Columbia of that period would use. Um, sound just jumps out when you go to that very, very nar narrow stylus. But assuming they're in good condition, and most of them are, um, if you can find them, <laughs> uh, they're also quite rare. Uh, they do play well. Now, the artists that uh, Broom recorded uh, were uh, quite a group, actually. Uh, again, probably due to his deep connections within the black cultural community uh, from promoting concerts and so forth. Uh, clockwise from the top here, uh, we have Clarence Cameron White, the violinist, uh, Harry T. Burley, top right, then Florence Cole Talbert, the bottom right, and Edward Boatner, B-O-A-T-N-E-R. Uh, a word about Burley. Uh, I had a Bur uh, Harry T. Burley record, uh, the one that I showed you actually, for many years, had no idea who he was or even when it was from, uh, I've discovered since that he was a big deal in the field. He was probably the most respected uh, black uh, composer as well as uh, concert tenor in the, or baritone in the uh, classical field, uh, concert field in the time. Uh, so it was a big get for him to record. There have been biographies uh, written about him. Uh, the uh, scholarly biographies. Uh, the early ones say that he never recorded, so we'll never hear that glorious voice that so impressed people at the time. Well, obviously he did record, and it's on the CD now. Uh, he only made one recording, uh, although he may have appeared on others as the accompanist, the pian pianist. Some of his arrangements are used on the others. Uh, but apparently he didn't like the sound of his own voice, so that was his one recording, but that was released go down Moses. Uh, others that were recorded by uh, Broom included R. Nathaniel Dett, uh, and, uh, who's a pianist, and uh, Antoinette Garns on the right. Uh, some of these are pretty notable people too in the field, uh, including Dett, uh, and several of them never recorded anywhere else. 
uh, later in their life. So these are the only uh, recordings we have of them. Um, now, after the uh, broom label, which basically was mail order label, which uh, was primarily in 1920, uh, 1919 and 1920, it was sold, uh, although he continued to sell them off after that for a while. Uh, after that, um, we moved to the more familiar Black Swan label, uh, which was fun founded by W.C. Handy's uh, publishing partner, Harry Pace, and uh, became active in 1921. This was a larger operation, more like a traditional record label. Uh, Pace rounded up support and financing, importantly, from members of the Black Harlem elite, including uh, Du Bois, W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, and one of the guiding principles of the company, stated principles of it at the start, and one of the reasons he got so much support, is he vowed to uh, advance black uplift and record serious classical artists. Uh, that was a big draw for the people who were giving him money. His studio musical director was Fletcher Henderson, and his arranger was William Grant Still, uh, both notable names. Uh, and his talent included, uh, and he did put out several uh, concert recordings early in its history. Hattie King Revis, uh, Florence Cole Talbert in the middle, and Antoinette Garnes again. Those last two had previously recorded for Broom. Uh, also Ravella Hughes, Carol Clark, a few others. Unfortunately, um, Uplift failed to sell. <laughs> the uh, realities of the marketplace uh, uh, intruded, and Pace had to fall back on jazz and blues recordings just to stay afloat uh, for a couple more years. Ethel Waters became his biggest star. Uh, it would take several more years, and star artists like Paul Robeson and Marian Anderson, uh, and the backing, finally, by the mid-20s, of major labels for black concert artists to finally break through on record. So that's the background on the companies represented and the recordings represented on this CD. And for more on the project and its origins, Les Gerber. Thank you. Um, I should mention right now that at the end of my presentation, we're going to have a bit of a surprise follow-up. Okay, um, <clears throat> what happened to me was, I still remember it vividly, I was on Cape Cod where I used to um, go regularly and I was in a record, a bookstore there that had a record department and I saw this set of CDs called um, Lost Sounds <clears throat> and I picked it up and I looked at it and I saw the name Nathaniel Dett. And that made what hair I had at the time stand up because I was already f quite familiar with Det's music. Um, I had a recording by the late pianist Natalie Henderis of the complete In the Bottom Suite. And I liked the music very much. I'd heard other pieces of his too. But I had no idea the man had ever made a record. I think if somebody had asked me, I said, no, he didn't record. Well, that was the way it was with all these broom artists, we didn't know they existed uh, on recordings. So of course I bought the CDs, I brought them home, I listened to them, I found them absolutely fascinating. And mixed in with all these other early black artists in various fields of music, going back as early as 1893, there were these five recordings from the broom label of classical music. And, I mean, I'm not the world's greatest expert on recordings, but I have been involved in historical recordings most of my life, and I'd never heard of any of this stuff. I think most people in the field hadn't. So, I listened to this set repeatedly, and I used to think, I wonder what could be done to isolate the classical recordings and augment them because the program notes in Lost Sound stated clearly that there were 10 broom sides and only five of them were in there. And I thought about it because I had a CD label going and the more I thought about it, the more I thought, nah, this is gonna be impossible. This is like a, um, 
a project for some kind of foundation because acquiring all this material would be the type of project that a small operator like me could never pull off. So I put the thought aside. A couple of years ago, I pulled out Lost Sounds again. I had heard, I had listened to it since then. It's a fascinating set. I pulled it out and I listened to it again and I thought, what the hell? Let's find out so that when I close the door on this project, at least I'll know I found out if it was possible. I got in touch with Tim. I asked if it was possible that I could use all of his Broom records, because as far as I know, he has the only set in existence. Am I right about that? I don't know. Well, as far as we know, it's certainly the only one that has come to light. And much to my surprise, he was very cooperative. And he said, I, I've always wondered why nobody ever tried to do this project. He told me about some other recordings that he had. And then I got in touch with Steve Smolian, who's an old, old friend of mine. I know him for half a century now. And <laughs> I knew that he had a very large collection and dealer stock of old recordings, and that this was the sort of thing that might interest him, and that he might be interested in doing the restoration work. And he said, yeah. And he sent me a list of what he had. Between the two of these guys, Tim and Steve, I put together all this material in a week. I thought it would take years to compile, but I had the right two people. And they had, between them, all the certainly known Hayes recordings. As Tim said, there's one more that may or may not have been recorded. We don't know for sure. And almost all of the Black Swan classical recordings, they were issued in a 7100 series, and there was one violin record that was issued in another series that we have not found. But aside from that, bingo, I had all the brooms, all the Hayes private recordings, and all the Black Swan classical recordings, and I had a CD. And Steve, who never knows how to let go of anything, kept doing research after I figured the project was already done, and he came up with an absolutely startling item. He found a radio recording of one additional song by Harry Burley, which was completely unknown to anybody. I mean, as Tim mentioned, the biography of Harry Burley says he never made any recordings. He did make one commercial recording for Broom, and we found another one made a couple of decades later on the, from a radio broadcast. <coughs> You'll have to excuse me. I'm not contagious, I promise you. My doctor says so. Um, so I went ahead and put out the CD. And... I got a couple of marvelous endorsements to put on the front cover. One of them from one of the greatest black opera singers who ever lived, Grace Bunbury, and the other from one of the greatest American poets who happens to be black, Rita Dove, former poet laureate, whom, as I knew from having had a discussion with her once, was a serious cello student and had considered making a career as a cellist before she went into poetry. She said um, stage fright got her. But apparently she had become quite a good cellist because when I mentioned that um, the cellist Janos Starker had been a distant relative of mine, she said, oh, I played for him once. So I guess she was a pretty serious cellist. And the two of them wrote these notes that are on the front of the CD, and bingo, we had a disc. Uh, Steve busted his ass working on restoring these recordings. If you go to the ParnassusRecords.com website, you'll be able to hear a little example 
of one of the recordings, one of the Clarence Cameron White violin recordings, before and after. As it came right off the record, and as it sounded after Steve was finished with his restoration. The difference is amazing, absolutely amazing. So in order to introduce you more fully to um, the Black Swan CD, I've picked a few samples to play. Uh, I could have picked more. I could have chosen differently, but I can't keep you here all night, and I have a bus to catch. So we're going to hear a few samples, and the first one we're going to hear is possibly the most important recording on this disc, and that is the, uh, the uh, Bur broom recording of Harry Burley. Harry Burley, as Tim mentioned, was a very important man, um, and he was an extremely successful singer. In 1892, in a blind audition, he auditioned for the job of the chief singer for the services of a um, church in New York, and um, it was only because it was a blind audition that he succeeded. But he wound up uh, teaching at St. George's, uh, singing at St. George's Church in New York for 52 years. He also became the lead singer at Temple Emmanuel in New York, which he did for 25 years. He performed in oratorios in Boston. He wrote many songs. Um, the concert songs he wrote were standard mainstream classical music with no particular black influence, but he also made a large number of concert transcriptions of spirituals, which we used for many years and probably still are. Um, and that's what we have a Burley. Uh, there was a review in the um, association's journal which kind of denigrated Burley's singing, but I don't agree with it at all. I think he was really exciting to hear. And so the first thing we're going to hear is, I guess, the first boom recording of uh, Harry Burley singing his own arrangement of Go Down Moses and almost certainly accompanying himself at the piano. So as you hear this, you can think to yourself, this man was probably singing while he was sitting. I also think it's a wonderful arrangement. Um, it's very respectful. It doesn't try to make more out of the uh, song than it is, but it sets it well for concert use. Um, I recently did a spoken introduction for 
uh, the Metropolitan Opera broadcast of Porgy and Bess. Uh, I do that at my local uh, hall in uh, Poughkeepsie, New York. And um, I brought up the issue of how George Gershwin would have known that he could have available enough well-trained black singers to sing his opera, which is what it is. Gershwin was very much tied into black American culture. He was, for example, a personal friend of Fats Waller's. And I recently solved a mystery that had been bothering me for a long time, which was I was wondering how Fats Waller wound up studying piano with Leopold Godofsky, which he did for some time. Gershwin introduced them. Um, Gershwin must have known that there was this tradition of trained black classical singers, opera singers, uh, who would be able to handle the demands of a work like Porgy and Bess. And in fact, as you probably know, he insisted on staging it with all black singers, and the Gershwin estate still insists that all performances of Porgy and Bess have to be done only with black singers. Mm -hmm. What we're hearing now is some of the tradition that these musicians came from. Uh, the item that most attracted my attention to uh, Lost Sounds when it came out was seeing the name of Nathaniel Dett. <coughs> so I wanted to play him for you. Uh, it's a little bit unfortunate that when they were selecting the two pieces that Det recorded, they did not include his biggest hit, the Juba Dance, which was recorded by four different pianists in the 1920s, including Percy Granger. Uh, it would have been really exciting to hear Det playing the Juba Dance, but he recorded two other pieces from his suites, and they're both actually quite different in style from the Juba Dance, which is a very enthusiastic, exciting dance number. These are both much gentler, sweeter, and more lyrical. Uh, but he plays them very beautifully. And it's a real pleasure to hear a man of this importance whose actual sound record seemed to have been lost to posterity actually playing his own music. So here is Nathaniel Dett, by the way, uh, a Canadian by birth, although he came to America at the age of 10 playing his um, Barcarolle, another piece from the suite in the bottoms.
I think it's a charming piece. I think it's beautifully played. And for 1919, it's not even all that bad sound. Um, part of that is due to the fact that Broom used some unknown good recording studio, and part of it is because of Steve Smolian's work. Um, when I talk about this CD to other people, I expect to get a kind of a skeptical reaction along the lines of, well, these people are historically important for sure, but are they really the kinds of artists who could have made their way in the concert world and the opera world if they had been white? Or are we doing a kind of a artistic affirmative action here? Um, I don't think so. Um, and my favorite example of several that I could use is Florence Cole Talbert, who was, uh, to the best of my uh, knowledge and my research, the only one of these singers who ever appeared on stage in a professional opera production in a small city in Italy. She sang the role of Aida. Um, is she the kind of singer whom we honor just because she's a pioneer of African-American culture? Or was she really the kind of singer who could have made herself a career if the um, concert world had been more accepting? I'll leave that up to you to judge as you hear her sing the famous uh, bell song from Delib's Lachme. <laughs>
hundred years ago. If she was singing a recital where I could get to hear her, I'd go. Um, I'm going to, uh, that by the way was a Black Swan recording. The other, first, the two that we heard first were both broom recordings. Uh, I'm going to conclude my selections from the Black Swan's CD with one of Roland Hayes's recordings, which are really essential. I mean, he is, has the biggest representation on this disc because he made the most records. And of course, he had a career that lasted many years beyond this period. Uh, as I recall, he gave his last recital at the age of 85. And not long after his failed self-recording project, he went to Europe where he recorded for Vocalion and he continued to have a recording career up through the LP era when he made a whole series of recordings for Vanguard. So I picked uh, from the many tracks of uh, Roland Hayes that we have, something that I thought would be particularly familiar so that you could compare his singing with that of others whose work you know. So here is Roland Hayes singing Vesti La Juba. Okay, he's not Caruso, but nobody else is anyway. That was a real singer. That was somebody who I think could definitely have had a different kind of career if he hadn't had the prejudice to deal with at his time. Now at this point, I'm going to take what's going to seem at first like a real detour into what is going to seem at first like a completely unrelated subject. It's not and I'll be tying it to get together with these very quickly. 
In the late 1970s, I don't remember the exact year, I happened to be driving around Philadelphia one day. I turned on my car radio to the local classical music station and I heard somebody playing the harpsichord. And it was very striking playing. I think what I tuned in on was Bach. And it was really splendid Bach playing. Uh, it was a live concert. The announcer mentioned the name of the harpsichordist, Francis Cole, which told me nothing. And I listened through to the end of the broadcast, which I remember also included Bartok's Romanian folk dances played on the harpsichord. I only recently discovered that Bartok had said that some of his piano music would go well on the harpsichord. But she had, I don't know if she knew that, but she had the idea and it worked very well. Um, the next day, I happened to run across a poster for that concert. I had the good sense to take it. And it was from this poster that I learned for the first time that the harpsichordist was a black woman. I didn't know if it was a man or a woman just from the name. Um, I looked to see if there were any records. There weren't. In fact, the only record she ever made was one where she accompanied a baritone uh, in a collection of colonial American songs, no solo recordings. Um, then what I learned was that she had died in 1983 at the age of 45 of cancer. She had taught at Queens College. Um, she had been a known recitalist. Um, as I was looking her up online, I came across the name Paula Robeson, the flutist whom I happen to know. So I got in touch with Paula and she said, oh yes, I remember playing with uh, Frances Cole. She was a marvelous player, but we only did one concert together and it wasn't recorded. So for years, I've been wondering if there was ever a chance that I could find any recordings of the playing of Frances Cole. Fast forward to last summer when I went to the National uh, Convention of the ARSC in Portland. And since I was hanging out with a lot of sound archive people, I mentioned to each one of them, do you know anything about a harpsichordist named Frances Cole? Do you know if there are any recordings of her? Everybody said no. One of the ones who said no was a librarian named Randy Jones who is now one of my favorite people in the whole world. And she said, no, I don't, but I'll ask around. About two weeks later, I found myself sitting in front of the computer with tears coming out of my eyes. I had received an email from um, a librarian at Westminster Choir College in Princeton, New Jersey. Cole also taught there and they had tapes of her playing. I actually went in person to the school to get the tapes. I didn't want to take any chances on, on their being um, shipped anywhere. Uh, he had sent me some files that had been made from the tapes, but they were pretty casually done and um, it didn't sound good. So I picked up the tapes and then I drove them down to Maryland and took them to, who else? Steve Smolian, who's also very good at tape restoration. Later this year, I'm going to be publishing a two CD set of live performances by Frances Cole. Her first representation on CD, the first publication of any, lo of any solo recordings of her. They are phenomenal. She plays Scarlatti like a demon. She plays her own transcription of the Bach Chacon for solo harpsichord, and it's hair-raising. She plays Bartok. 
she plays Ligeti's Continuum, a piece which completely reimagined the possibilities of the harpsichord and which I suspect she was probably the first American musician to play. This is from 1974, just a few years after it was written. I brought you a sample of Frances Cole's playing. And as I said, she, not, didn't, defy, she didn't um, restrict herself to harpsichord music. So here is the next step in my black musical cultural history project. Francis Cole playing Gottschalk on the harpsichord.
Steve wants you to know, by the way, that that's a preliminary dub, and it will sound better when it gets published. Um, if you take a look at this up close, you'll probably agree with me that she was also one of the most beautiful women who ever lived. But um, <clears throat> really, a substantial artist, and I'm thrilled to be involved in rescuing her, um, the sound of her playing. Do we have time for some questions? There's plenty of time. There's plenty of time for questions. You Tim? Even, you can even play a few things, more of them. <clears throat> Tim, do you want to um, yeah. yeah. take questions? Sure. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. Comments? Suggestions? Uh, yes. Hold on, hold on. Wait a second. Why don't the two of you sit down at the desk to make yourselves comfortable? Okay. That's where we got the microphone. Oh, look at this. <laughs> yes, it's a new invention. Get used to it. Wow. Wait, wait, you need, you need to wait for the microphone. Any reviews at the time comparing uh, Burley's voice and Roland Hayes to uh, Paul Robeson? Well, they're not the same vocal type at all. Okay. I mean, Robeson... But I mean, in, ter in terms of power of the voice. Um... I would say that's difficult. Um, what do you think, Tim? I think it's difficult because of the difference in their types of voices. Okay. I mean, Robeson was a bass baritone. Okay. He had the kind of voice where I would like to kill the guy and steal his voice so I could <laughs> speak like that. Um, it doesn't work that way. <coughs> Hayes had a somewhat lighter uh, tenor, but it was a powerful tenor, as we heard. Yeah. Uh, I don't think they had any training in common, but I don't know for sure. Yeah, Hayes, um, the, the sides he made, he was trying to show, I think, the versatility that he, and by extension, a black performing artist could do. Think of what he chose for that. Vesti La Juba, I mean, so identified with Caruso. Another one he recorded was, I Hear You Calling Me, you know, irrevocably uh, attached to John McCormick. Uh, and, spirit, and the spirituals that he recorded. Uh, so he was showing quite a, a variety of stuff. By the time other labels, like Vocalion, uh, he did a deal with them to record, they only wanted spirituals. They didn't want any of that classical stuff at all. Uh, and as a spiritual singer, uh, he was quite restrained, actually. Uh, in fact, that was part of his appeal, that uh, on some of his later Columbias, for example, around 1940, uh, he does some a cappella, and, and they're eerie. They're absolutely eerie. They're so, you can hear there's so much power that's not being expressed there. So that was kind of what he did. Also, uh, he was nearly, not nearly as widely publicized as Robeson was, for example. Mm. Didn't make nearly yeah. as many recordings, uh, largely because he was a very demanding man. And he uh, famously uh, chopped up the recordings, uh, cut with scissors the recordings that HMV made with him in, in England because they weren't up to his standards or they wouldn't pay him enough or something like that. Uh, whereas Robeson uh, recorded widely, of course, starting in the mid-20s on, on and appeared in movies and so forth. So he's a, he was a better known. Um, but Hayes, when he was uh, reviewed, he gave a lot of uh, concerts. Uh, he didn't appear on the radio either. Uh, but he gave a lot of concerts, and they were well reviewed. He um, he did a fair amount of classical art song in the later part of his career, right. when he'd become well enough known so he could get away with it and didn't have to restrict himself to spirituals. Any other questions? Useful question. Thank you. <laughs> so you're one of the Beecham uh, crowd, huh? Yes. What did Beecham say about a harpsichord? Beecham said a harpsichord sounded like skeletons copulating on a tin roof. <laughs> I happen to love the harpsichord myself. <laughs> All right, any other questions? By the way, you may want to speak to me. I, found, I got from the late Don Hodgman two recitals of Roland Hayes in 1953, I think up in Har at Harvard that were yeah. recorded surreptitiously. Basically, he recorded uh, 
after these recordings. Yeah. Uh, he recorded uh, for Vocalion in England, as you mentioned. Uh, then he didn't record again commercially until the late 30s. Yeah, I think so. Uh, he, yeah. he, he tried to do a deal with Victor, and Victor right. wouldn't let him record the stuff he wanted in the, in the early mid-30s and so forth. Uh, he's very demanding. And then uh, after that, he doesn't record until Vanguard in the 50s, right? Uh, well, he made a couple more personal recordings in the late 40s, actually. So there are these, uh, big holes. There are these big holes of time with him. Big holes of time in his career. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, Smithsonian issued a CD that was a retrospective of Hayes yes. and co covers his singing over a wide range of time, but it does not go back as far as the brooms. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, as the, as the private records. I think there was a concert at the Library of Congress in the late 30s. There's a concert at the Library of yeah. Congress that exists. When the Library of Congress did that syndicated series about what, 25 years ago? That was put over NPR. They, they broadcast that concert. Yeah. Okay. I remember that vividly. Okay. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for a most illuminating evening and a, and a, a great way of presenting this very, very important issue. Uh, if any, excuse me. Yes. If anybody can't stand to go home without a copy of Black Swans, I do have a few with me. Yeah, he has a few. Okay. All right. Thank you again. Uh, just to let you know, our next meeting is a month from today, which will be March 19th. We're going to have a cantor by the name of Ralph Zelli who will discuss cantorial recordings. Gary, it's of uh, Between the World Wars in Germany? Yeah. Okay. Of recordings uh, of... Before and after. Before, before and after World War II. Right. That should be also very interesting. As always, we always have interesting evenings and people will give very interesting introspective uh, ideas on what they're presenting because they're such experts like what we had this evening. Uh, stay warm. See you in a month. Thank you.